The Final Realization In the weeks since my return, the world has changed. My frantic early morning writing holds me in its grasp, and I become greedy of my time. The moment I arrive home, jet lag and I wage a private war. I refuse to give in to it, and it refuses to give in to me. And so, we compromise. Fighting the doses at my desk in the early afternoon, struggling to stay awake until eight each night, I surrender to my soft, white, welcoming sheets, knowing I will be wide awake for my trip to Africa at 4 a.m. while Maui is still asleep. Maui holds no power over me, with hours yet until her dawn breaks. She continues her competition through distractions of every sort, but at this hour, she leaves me alone. I let Africa in through that portal under the watchful eye of Duma, and I am transported. I once again immerse myself in her sights and sounds and smells, and she takes over. It is late afternoon in this place of wild holiness, and the Duma stalks her prey as I write in darkness halfway around the globe. I write until, just before the light creeps in, the Cardinal announces that Maui wakes. Africa reluctantly bids good night as she turns toward the wilds of darkness and allows Maui to claim me, as she does each day. The week in between my return and Dad and Hetty's arrival, Maui has been doing backflips with her display of sunsets and sunrises, puffy clouds and rainbows. She wants me back and she is jealous. But Africa has so filled me that I have no room for Maui, not yet. She is a petulant child, and I try to appease her in the glaring light of day, but she is aware of my true focus. Reveling in the experience that is Africa, I rise at four and write as long as the words pour through my fingers. This is the only way to make room for Maui again, but she is impatient. Patience has never been one of her virtues, nor one of mine. The day after Dad and Hetty arrive, the trade winds stop dead. Activity at the crater on the Big Island is high. With no winds to broom it away, volcanic ash settles around us like a shroud, blocking Maui's spectacular views and wreaking havoc on those with allergies. It is their first morning in Puamana, and Hetty has sneezed about a hundred times in rapid succession. The weather turns harsh. The rain comes and the wind blows and ruins another day in paradise for them. I shift my perspective and look inwardly at my behavior since their arrival. I realize I have been less than welcoming to this woman who is Daddy's wife. Daddy had been lonely and needed companionship. At 90, the man is still vital. Why was I trying to compete for his affections with a woman who will give him happiness for the rest of his life? As I come to the realization that this woman simply loves this man and wants only to take care of him and be with him, my attitude changes. The inclement weather stops, and the day dawns clear and bright and scrubbed clean. The volcanic vog has been washed away by the rain, and the trades return. On my walk with Cheetah that Sunday afternoon, I see whales dancing, and the sun's light weaves through the remnants of volcanic dust in the dying day. Interesting. Maui accepted Africa into our lives when I accepted Hetty. My decision to accept her has led to peace. I take my walk to get the mail, and I watch the sun shimmer off the waves and the surfers who navigate them. I am about to cross the bridge when the final realization strikes me like a bolt of lightning. With thoughts of Hetty settled and the final fear absolved, the vog lifts from my mind and I am able to see again with crystal clarity. When I have flashes of writing, I've often thought it was mom writing through me. And I assume that the same was true in this recent writing jag since my return from the wild. But I consider, and realize, I have not been feeling her. I review the sunsets and rainbows, whales and waves. I have not felt her as I have so many times in the past. So if she had not been speaking through the writing, then my joy in the writing has been mine alone, not hers. When Hetty came to visit, the weather reflected my displeasure. And once I accepted Hetty, the resulting calm was my calm and the beauty of this island paradise shone because I was proud. I step further back. When had I felt Mom's presence last? Not when I arrived at Nairobi Airport at the end of the journey. I had arrived there alone. 
not at Amsterdam, where I had immediately sought solace in the first-class lounge and allowed the experience at the orphanage to flow out of me and onto the yellow legal pad. The long flight was filled with amazing images and periods of deep sleep, but she had not been there in Chicago when I arrived, or even when I stepped onto the jet the next morning to go home to my own love and my furry children. When the internal rewind ends, I stand there soaking in the sunset at the entrance to the bridge, and it hits me. Mom is gone. She has been gone for a while now. I hadn't noticed, thanks to the manifold distractions of Dad and Hetty, and work, and Africa, and Maui's tug-of-war over my attention. I had passed through the cheetah portal so many times that the magic is now in me. The power that Mother had is now my power. I cross the bridge and stand at the banyan tree, and I realize the very moment she had left. When the cheetah Tiva had come to me in the enclosure at the orphanage, had licked my arm, my neck, my chin, and bowed to me, I was dazed and confused. Christopher had caught these moments on his camera. The week following my return, when he was still in Kenya and having difficulty with email, all that made it through was that one photo. I thanked him for it, and he indicated surprise that I had received it, for he had received the message that the photo had never reached my email address and had been kicked back to him. The picture had come through the portal on its own. This is the moment Mom was welcomed into the next world, and I had watched her go. But I was not to realize it until the book was finished. As I stood under the banyan tree, the tears flowed. She had summoned me to Africa to let her go. I had freed her of her demons and given her the window of escape. She had ridden on my shoulder through terrifying rides through city streets and graced every step with cheetah tracks begging me on. She had calmed the leopard in the tree so we could approach her. She had cried with me at the dry riverbed, among the elephants digging in dirt for life-sustaining water. She had even been with me as I threw water on my hair. She'd been trying to show me the importance of this most precious of elements. She was there with the mother cheetah and her son, with the three black rhino, and finally at the orphanage, where our magic melded into one in the amber eyes of a cheetah as she gazed into mine. Mom had been released through the cheetah portal. <laughs>